speaker tonight, Rick Hamlin. And uh, Rick lives in Warren, Massachusetts. And uh, basically, he has been a potter for years, since 1976. And he also became very interested in researching the historical redware potters and clay industries of New England altogether. And he was telling me that he actually, what, for 10 years, worked at Old, uh, old Sturbridge Village. Um, and so um, we're really looking forward to his talk uh, tonight. He is re refers to himself as the Pied Pipe Potter, not the Pied Potter, <laughs> the Pied Potter Hamlin. And essentially, if you take that linguistically apart, um, it means colorful potter from a small town, because pie apparently means multicolored, and potter is the tree. So in Hamlin translates one from a small town. So he is a um, basically a potter from a small town. And uh, we are. I'm in a small one in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking forward to this talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. We'd like a seat. I'm good. You're good? All right. All right. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. And um, as part of my trade of being a potter, I do a lot of school programs. And I uh, bring potters wheels into a lot of different places. This morning, I was doing a Greek pottery program, a classical Greek pottery program in an elementary school. So I'm going to start this in a sense the same way, which doesn't apply to you. This is what I do with the kids when I'm doing my colonial and early American program. Before I share any information, we sign a contract. I'm, you make a promise, I make a promise. You become my apprentices. The cutoff year, though, is when you turn 21. So it works better with high school kids. <laughs> But the way it works is that the contract, and this is a copy from an original contract, which because of the fact that it's school kids is one thing I left out um, for controversy, but I promise to teach your name the entire arts and mysteries of pottery making and to find good, sufficient clothing and to find uh, uh, food and drink Washing and lodging. Sufficient washing. That's all you need. That's all I'm promising. I will teach you to read, write, and cipher, to do math, to keep accounts, and to learn the business, and to give you one new suit of clothes when you turn 21. You don't get the new clothes up until... It was funny. I was doing this uh, for a uh, fifth grade group preparing to go to Old Sturbridge Village. And this very well-dressed girl in the corner just looked up and she said, wait a minute, what does sufficient clothes mean? <laughs> and the teacher said, hand me down, stuff like that. And she didn't want to sign the contract. <laughs> Your promise to me is that you would learn the art and mystery of the potter's trade, drink time. You will pray faithfully serve and not be absent without leave from Master Hamlin and to keep the master's secrets to protect the master's property and not to marry or gamble. And the last one is fornicate. <laughs> so all of the three things that are important. This is an indenture contract. So I would sign my name, you'd sign your name. You rip it in half. Any idea why this is called an indenture now? It is so simple and silly, you're going to hate yourself for it. So we get on each other's nerves. You have my promise, I have your promise. We don't get along. So we go off to the uh, court and we say there's a problem in the promises. I'm not letting the kid, says I'm not letting them wash up enough, I don't know. Um, Maybe the kid's sharing my secrets with everybody in the neighborhood. So, the two promises are going to fit together. It's an indenture, denture, teeth, fit together. It's rather silly, isn't it? But that's how it works. That's why this is called an indenture, the teeth fit together. 
So, knowing now that I'm being recorded, there goes my secret. <laughs> Pottery making in Massachusetts isn't what a lot of people think it is, quite frankly. Um, American Indians have been making pottery here for 4,000 years, another 4,000 years earlier in South America, and then moving up from South America up into our area. So it's 4,000 years old, the American Indians. It's going to the European wheel potters with their potter's wheel will arrive in Mexico in 16, the 1570s and in Paris Island. North Carolina in 1580s. So the Spanish are the first European potters. 1611, they're going to be moving into Virginia. Now, depending on how you want to read what a potter is, you could say the first potters arrived in Massachusetts in 1630 or in 1635 36. Big difference. Um, they thought in Salem the most important thing to do was to make glass. They were shipping in enough pottery from England, so they wanted to build a glass house in the area of Gallows Hills, as a matter of fact, where the witches were hung in the late 17th century. Um, it's also called Glass House Field at the end. Potters were brought in, Quaker potters, Southwick, Osborne, they were brought in to make the crucibles for melting the sand. They weren't making pots for eating out of. They were making tools, big heavy clay pots. And you'll also find potters being brought into the iron works in Saugus and Taunton and all over. So potters were brought in to make pots that were unrelated, but the first to the household, but the first potters that did show up we're in the Salem area, and we're in the Medford area, and there's 1635-36. Uh, From that area, they start to go in up the coast into Gloucester, um, then up into Portsmouth. Not so much moving up the Merrimack River out of Charlestown and Medford, but moving up in that area. Salem is going to become a hotbed. There's going to be 100, over 100 potters in Charlestown right up until the Revolutionary War. It's going to be brickyards everywhere. And um, with the harvesting clay out of the back of Bunker Hill and Breed's Hill. Bunker, Breed's Hill, which is now called Bunker Hill, um, is a type of clay deposit that is uh, brought down from the glaciers, it's called the drumlin. So it's a Scottish word, it means whale. And if you go into the Connecticut Valley, you're going to see drumlins everywhere. They look like sleeping whales. You've got a long slope, and then you've got a <coughs> quick drop in the front. So these drumlins are the sources of clay in the Charlestown area. 100 potters, British block, Boston Harbor, hardship is encountered, they burn Charlestown. People in Charlestown are pleading um, for help. Some guy sees a couple lanterns in a North Church, takes a little boat ride across to Charlestown, gets chased by the British. He leads them through the clay pits. The clay pits are familiar to him, not to the British troops. They get the horses stuck in the clay pits. They fall off their horses, so Paul Revere gets to ride off onto uh, his ride. The Masons and the uh, potters build redoubts on top of Reed's Hill out of the brick and clay making uh, potters tools and um, try to you know, defend Charlestown, which will, like I said, which will burn down beforehand. So the trade has got a huge presence there until Charlestown is burnt. 100 potters, a lot of brick makers. We're shipping pots out of that area down to um, to the Caribbean, we're shipping pots and bricks up into Nova Scotia. It is a monster of a trade that we're doing. But it's going to disappear after the Red War. Brick making still continues. 
one of the earliest families that's making bricks out there. Um, makes a lot of money at it. Uh, the name is Tufts. The Tufts family. James Tufts was the first. He and his sons expand out into the Charlestown, Medford area making bricks. So you go into Somerville, you go into Medford. Uh, the clay pits are going to be a couple hundred acres in size. And they're going to eventually flood up. So what you find in the 1870s and 80s is that the state, Massachusetts, will come in and say, hey, we have a malaria outbreak from Boston down to Providence fill in your brickyard. So all the Tufts parks that you see in Somerville, Cambridge, etc., were former <coughs> brickyards. There were that many of them. Um, the malaria outbreak caused a big shift, as a matter of fact, in the brickyard, in the clay pits closing out in the Boston area, and the brickyards moving to Western Mass. Now the clay that so far that I'm referring to is the red clays. I was asked about in Shutesbury, there's uh, a gray clay, Sheffield Mass, it's more of a gray green clay. As a matter of fact, the Green River is, because of clay deposits, it's called green. Um, you go down towards Connecticut, the clay can be more red or orange. The iron in the clay is going to affect the raw color of the clay. And the raw color of the clay is going to be affected when it rusts in the kiln to change in color, depending on how high the pots are fired, uh, and I'll get into the firing a little later, um, or the amount of iron in the clay is going to make the clay turn red. So the clay will actually rust in this case. What we find in Massachusetts are five commercial clays of interest. <coughs> We got white clays, we got red clays that are going to be broken down depending on whether they are smooth or whether they are excessively, moderately sandy or excessively sandy. So if they're moderately sandy, you can make tiles out of them. And the potters in the Charlestown area in the 17th century made roof tiles. Um, if, if it's up to 25% sand, you're going to be making bricks. You can take the sand out of the bricks if you want or uh, for, the brick, uh, for the clay for the bricks, or you can add sand to potter's clay. But nonetheless, within the red clay is going to be potter's clay, tile making clay, brick making clay. And sometimes there's an overlap in the trade, and sometimes there won't be. There's going to be in Northampton and in Clinton another type of clay that's called fuller's earth, and that's used to extract out of uh, wool the lanolin. Uh, Fuller's earth became very popular as kitty litter at one point, or for picking up oil in auto garages. So that's a different kind of clay. Oxford is going to have a clay that, and Charlton have a clay that's called ochre earth, which is really nice for being a paint pigment. So we have all these commercial differences. The white clays, um, are uh, going to be the earliest clays. Those are the ones that go back millions of years versus the red clays are going to be going back. They're deposited in between each glacial age. So you have uh, the top layer of red clays in, in Massachusetts. Um, for instance, like in the, Sal in the Peabody area, which was the second hotbed of making pottery in the 18th century. The top layer is going to be smooth, fresh water deposit when the glacier uh, melted, but below it's going to be a clay layer that's full of fossilized shells deposited when there was saltwater oceans over it. And we're talking 140 feet of clay. Um, I don't know if I was clear when I said it. Um, areas uh, producing eight pound bricks, for instance, uh, producing thousands of bricks a year have completely changed the landscapes of Massachusetts. <laughs> We are not looking at what they looked at in the colonial um, and early American era. Uh, the brick making industry really took a lot of clay out of the, out of the soil. Um, the potters that would be working in the area, in, in Massachusetts, in Peabody, especially in Salem and Beverly, 
We're uh, making parts, sometimes for export, sometimes for local use. That's the difficulty about explaining what kind of potter you're going to be, because there are different examples of potters. In Charlestown, the potters were, in some cases, renting space out in a shop, <coughs> and then renting kiln space, for instance. And then there were other potters that were so aggressive in creating an industry for themselves that they um, actually petitioned for help from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. In 1711, Grace Parker and Isaac Parker were making red clay pots in, the Boston, in, in Charlestown. And they were getting pretty ticked off because this stuff called stoneware was coming up from Philadelphia. Stoneware clay types are somewhat found on Martha's Vineyard, for instance. But um, they went to Massachusetts court and they said, we need a monopoly guarantee. We need a zero interest loan. And the court returned with the lottery. They promoted the lottery, paid off the establishment of the Parkers making stoneware in Charlestown in 1711. They grabbed the clay from Philadelphia, along with a French Huguenot potter, Duché, who was the Duché family, besides working in Charlestown, also brought pottery, stoneware making down into Georgia. So they were quite. Um, they, they just have really expanded the trade of stoneware making. But nonetheless, Duché came up with a load of Philadelphia stoneware clay, grabbed some clay from Martha's Vineyard, which is a white pottery clay, very similar to this here, and from, proceeded for the next four kiln loads to completely blow up the loads, everything destroyed. So in six months' time, Isaac Parker was dead. Supposedly it was from the stress. And Grace Parker promoted the making of stoneware, pushed Duché even more so to make stoneware pottery, and um, eventually they succeeded. So the mother of pottery, of stoneware pottery making in Massachusetts is a woman by the name of Grace Parker. Her son, one of her sons was a goldsmith, the other one was a stoneware potter that eventually uh, would move to Boston, the name of John Parker. That's a completely different sense of what you're seeing. Park, John Parker, for the longest time, made drips, sugar drips, cone-shaped drips that went on a uh, you had a pot, you had this cone shape that went into it, Every one of them went down uh, to the Caribbean. We were shipping down to, to make sugar. They were used for making sugar. So the drips went down to the Caribbean. Molasses came up. And of course, we were across from Medford, which is old Mr. Boston rum. And we were making rum in the Medford area, big industry. So there was a circular thing that was happening. Um, in the Medford area also, like I said, there was a lot of bricks being made too. And I have read in, in many, many accounts of how frustrated the Boston builders were because they shipped their, send their men with wagons from Boston to Medford to pick up a load of bricks, uh, possibly from Tufts, and the, the guys would also pick up rum. So many a load was lost on the way. Um, Traveling over the roads exposes clay. And although I est established with you already that in 1630 or 35 the potters were the first to, when they first arrived, people had the necessity to use clay for their home use. So you're building a small house. Most people didn't have big houses. They had small one roomers. <coughs> the floor would be paved with clay. And if you, if you go to Plymouth Plantation, um, they have these egg-shaped containers with a little hole on top. They call them sprinklers. 
everybody buys in for water they got and there's a bunch of perforated, perforated holes in the bottom so you hold a little jug like this and you go around and you spray your house plants which is really nice so you got plants well in actuality they were to keep the floor in your house damp so the clay wouldn't dust up the clay was also used in the houses to uh, produce outdoor ovens or a type of chimney because not all the chimneys are made out of brick uh, they were made out of a, a weaving of sticks with five inches of clay smeared up along the inside and outside. So obviously at some point the clay falls off and the sticks ignite. And 1671, they stopped doing building codes in Massachusetts. Um, the houses above a certain size have to be made out of brick. Chimneys have to be made out of brick. So the brick industry is really going to be kicking off at that point. And by the early 18th century, people are just saying, look, we want to build wood structures. We can't build brick houses anymore. It was, it was a burden on their economy at that point. Um, you read town histories because of this, that people, when they move in, they're allocated public land for clay, public clay pits. And you also read in 1670s and again 1711, you can't dig clay out of the road anymore. They banned it because wagons churn up the clay, you're leaving potholes. So potholes were made illegal in 1670s in Massachusetts uh, because people were digging the clay out of there. And they were digging it, like I said, for their household use. Um, 1711, 17 teens, 17, 11. We have uh, Grace Parker making pottery in Boston. And um, they're making these things. Probably an apprentice project. These are copies of ones that, these actually were found out of the big dig. Um, the originals, I should say, were found out of the big dig. This is actually, I'll explain this in a second. This was found as a product of the big dig. Um, Long Wharf, which doesn't exist anymore, which was coastal at the time, which we filled in up to now, and now you can drive over Long Wharf, was the site of the pottery shops in that area, um, in Charlestown. And they found in the debris quite a number of these little guys. If they're white, they're made in England. If they're red, they're made by Grace Parker or many of the other potters that were located there before the Red War. These are hair curlers. <laughs> they would be saturated, you curl them up in, in your wig, put paper over it, put it in a warm oven. Easy project for apprentices. Like, um, let's see, other things that were a possibility that could have been made at that time too. Now this is a Virginia one. And this is dated to about the second quarter. There's only one Massachusetts example that I know of, of this. This is a jug. It's a bird jug. They date back to at least the 16th century. A stick would come out here, and these would be mounted on houses, so birds would fly in. And maybe, I think you're hoping for insect-eating birds more so than pretty birds, because obviously with all the animals you have, around you, you're going to have a lot of flies. So bird jugs like this um, were being made by the potter down in Virginia. His name was the poor potter of Yorktown. And he wasn't poor, and he wasn't a potter. But he was another competitor, I guess you could say, for Grace Parker. He was a merchant, had a lot of money, had enslaved people uh, making pottery for him. Um, but it was illegal to make pottery in Virginia, according to um, the Crown. You can make it up here in Massachusetts, can't make it down there. So a representative in England was confronted by the king, and he was asked, uh, the king said, I heard that there were potters making pottery, and this guy had a big, big business going, making pottery down in Virginia, to which he replied, no, that's just a poor potter of Yorktown, don't even worry about him, but like I said, he had enslaved people. So, cranking out these. So. so these are called Williamsburg bird jugs now. Poor Potter was the one making them. 
This is a jug, very similar to what would have been found in the Parker household. It's a drinking jug. Maybe it's a pouring jug, but we call this a jug. And the shape is going to say pretty much consistent up until the Rev War, the jug is going to start becoming more so like this, enclosed on top. And it doesn't become a drinking container more so than a carrying container. In the 18th century, archaeologically we find some, they're not as common as reenactors would want you to think they are because all reenactors run around with these now. <laughs> um, you go to Flint, uh, the Flint Museum, historic Deerfield, you'll find these going up to a gallon and a half in size, 15 handles around them. They are tigs for drinking out of and for passing around. So you've got two handles, you've got three handles. And they were, um, like I said, made in a lot of different ways. I don't have it with me, but I also make a rimless bowl. Now I have this bowl here too, but this is a porringer. This isn't a bowl, this isn't a cup. It's an eating container. But a rimless container with no handle on it, and that would have been a punch bowl. And uh, if, if it's got a rolled rim, certainly a kitchen pot. But if it doesn't have a rim around it, um, it's probably meaning you're drinking out of it. So punch is a, a word from India. It means number five, which explains the number of ingredients that would be going into punch. Water, citrus, spice, alcohol, and sugar. And that's how you make your punch. But this is a porringer. And the porringer is for eating out of, and eventually we'll take the flat rim off. If this was larger, say about a half gallon in size, you wouldn't want to eat out of it. It looks pretty much the same with the flat rim, but that becomes a chamber pot. <laughs> so in Boston, they made a lot of chamber pots in the early 18th century. Uh, they also made mugs like this. Now, Grace called herself, Grace and Isaac called themselves Potter. There was Another guy in the same time period was referred to as a um, pot baker, William Vincent, down in, um, down in Salem. They claim maybe he was Dutch. And this is a mug as well as this one that was found, uh, in, very similar, uh, found in Boston Dig. It's hard to say, they haven't been analyzed, whether they were being pots made in Massachusetts Bay Colony to emulate the Dutch pots, because he was a Dutch potter, he called himself a pot baker, or they were imported from the Netherlands. At, that, at this point, it's very confusing to figure that out. Um, but those were found in Boston. Pots like this are called cans, or maybe mugs, large mugs, small mugs. Terminology doesn't stick when you read the ledgers. Sometimes they call them large mugs, sometimes they call them cans. But we've also, as you can see, they go for the quantity, that's for sure. But lo and behold, and, and actually, this would be very Salem. Black Blaze, Brown Black Blaze. This would be very uh, Essex County, up towards uh, Medford. Slip on top, splots on it, um, made by a potter by the name of Kettle. In any of the shops that you would visit in the time, if you ask for a pot, this is what you get. This is the pot. For everything I just described here, this is a pot. For painting it, paint pot. Put tallow in it to keep for, cal for candles, it's a tallow pot. It is also the colonial bean pot. What we're familiar with, with the round bean pot with the rim and the one or two handles off the side. Although it's French and although it's Dutch, it's, there are no English made examples that are known until after about 1790, 1800. Then we start. Getting familiar with those, and in 1830, some of the potters are saying in their ledgers, 
tall and short bean pots. And it's the shorts that really we're more familiar with because the tall bean pots fit into a beehive oven very easily. A short bean pot is the one you need if you're using a cast iron stove. So when you get into the Civil War era, the potters are going to be changing, but this is also a bean pot. Bean, beans are stews. They're simple stools, uh, 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 stews that um, are very watery, even through the 1830s. We start putting molasses in them around that time or a little later, and we start arguing with New York, who makes better, Boston beans. You find this argument in the 1880s newspaper. New York red beans versus Boston brown beans. Who's better? So we go back and forth on that. Um, because of the argument, it probably attracted a group of men who were veterans from the Civil War to attend a reunion in Boston, the Grand Army of the Republic, in the 1880s, met in Boston. And the uh, organizers requested a potter in Beverly to make miniature little tiny bean pots, which sometimes about that size. Sometimes you see them in the stores. You said they would have a red ribbon around them. That production caused the town of Beverly to be called Bean Town. And if you were from Boston, uh, from, from Beverly, you were called a beaner, which they hated very, very, very much. And then, of course, Boston stole that, too. So, um, so that disappeared as far as, but Bo Beverly's originally the first Bean Town, um, not Boston. I got canning jars that I'd be making. I have a recipe where you pack this with peppered meat, potted meat, lay, put a layer of butter over the top, and when it's got a rolled rim, that means you're tying a cloth over it to keep things out of it. So preserve jars or canning jars are very popular as well. Uh, let's see, what else? I forgot to mention this jug. I agree. You know, uh, today I was throwing Greek pots, and um, I was making these. They date back to Egypt. They're called the ring jug. You find them during the Old Sturbridge Village period. You know, I don't find them in the uh, 18th century. I find them more in the 19th century. Supposedly, according to one author who wrote this back in the 1940s, these, they're, they're like this so you can carry your tools into the field. Well, yeah, it really works well. Um, <laughs> some of these theories. You fill it with switchel. Switchel up here, honey, uh, ginger water up in Vermont, honeyger down in Pennsylvania, vinegar mixed with a sweetener, maple syrup, molasses, so switchel, uh, honey down in Pennsylvania, ginger, spices. I think it's a precursor to soda. You throw herbs in it if you want. Most of the time when people experimented with it, when I worked at Old Service Village, it tasted like hot, sweet and sour sauce. It really was not that good. But there was one guy who made it, and it tasted pretty close to Coca-Cola. I was very, very surprised. You just had the herbs and everything in it. Right, and now if you, it's in the magazines and everything. Switchell has made a, a return. We, um, See. We as potters are going to be confronted by either using local clays and making red clay pots and trying to make a living out of it. If you are a potter and you do it your full life, that's pretty good. A lot of potters I see maybe by their 50s or 60s, they move on. It's a very hard job. Um, it's a very physical job. You're digging clay, Massachusetts again. Massachusetts Bay Colony said you have to dig your clay out of the ground in November. It was a law in 1670. You know, if you go to dig clay out of the ground now, good luck. <laughs> I think it's common sense to go when the ground is dry and break off rocks, but that's what they said. You're going to freeze the clay above ground because the clay has been there for thousands of years. The flat platelets of clay 
uh, need to be frozen to separate so they can take water in very easily. And Sheffield Mass, who's a clay supplier here in Massachusetts, still does this process. You go out there, you'll see mountains of clay that they've dug up um, surrounding their, their mixing area. So you freeze the clay, then in the spring, in the colonial times, the kid would be mixing the clay by walking on it with his feet, pushing it between your toes. If you go to the Colonial Williamsburg YouTube videos, you look up brick maker and you'll see school groups mashing clay with their feet. You can use oxen, you can use horse. And then the, the clay would be brought to the potter. That's great if you're local. If you're using red clay, and there's red clay pretty much throughout Massachusetts. If the difference is, like with Grace Parker, you want to do stoneware, then you have to start importing it in. Originally, like I said, it was in Philadelphia and um, Martha's Vineyard. And um, maybe you'll meet some success. It's going to die off. There's going to be several potters on the coast that are going to try to do this through the 18th century. But it's really going to explode in the 1820s and 30s where the stoneware pottery industry takes off, which is wonderful because your dad's been making redware and you're finding out in the 1820s and 30s that there's so many things on the market to buy. There's glass, there's tin, there's porcelain, there's creamware, there's pearlware, there's mocha ware, there's so much stuff that at this point, the redware isn't going to be the table pots. It's not going to be useful um, in any place generally than the kitchen. So your kids, your sons are saying, well, guess what? <laughs> You're breaking your back. And it's actually an ancient, a classical Greek term. Um, you're doing potter's work, which means when you're really laboring, when it's hard labor, doing potter's work was slang back then. Um, the clay that's red, maybe in the 1830s, will keep you in business. In Salem, Mass, I should say in Peabody, Mass, the industry was kicking really well. There were 100 potters there after the War of 1812. There was a lot of excitement. We banned imports from England. So there was a new generation uh, uh, of inspiration to produce glass and tin and a lot of exciting <coughs> products after the war, during the War of 1812 to challenge, to create American industry, uh, is the way to put it. And the potters um, were cranking out pots again, making some beautiful glazes, shipping stuff all over. We settled the war in England. The imports came in at one-fifth the cost of what they originally were selling before the war, shattered the potters' business. So coincidentally, the stoneware started picking up. The son said, Redware's dead. One of the potters out in Peabody finds himself, I mean, we're looking at 100 potters, and then we're going down to two in Peabody. And he's cranking out field drain tile using a big baloney maker called an extruder. And he's just cranking out these tiles. He's selling 30,000 feet a year to a farm. Uh, well, one order was for 30,000 feet to um, a farmer out in Beverly. So we're trying to do other things with pottery. Um, we're trying to stay in the clay business if we want to stay in the clay business. And we're focusing on new product. Some potters decide that they're not going to do any more pottery, like Herbie Brooks at Old Servage Village, than is necessary to offset their store debt or debt to somebody else. So Herbie Brooks, for instance, gets into a circle. He's paying off the blacksmith. Actually, he's paying off the blacksmith because the blacksmith owes money to somebody else. He's going to cancel the guy's debt by bringing pots to the store. And it's sort of, I don't want to say a community thing. I'm really resist, resisting that. But it's an exchange of barter. And that works out for a while. And then Herbie Brooks, uh, his son ran off to Georgia. So he went down to pick him up and brought a load of pots. So for a few years, he was bringing pots down to Georgia for selling. Um, selling down there, really extending his market, but picking stuff on the way and bringing stuff back. 
Herbie Brooks learned at a sh uh, learned at a shop in Litchfield, Connecticut, in Goshen, Connecticut, next to Litchfield, from a man who learned his trade. The guy's name was Kettle, who came from Charlestown. So Kettle, who's got a whole family he's competing with in Charlestown, and then we have the debacle of the burning of Charlestown, moves down to Litchfield, Connecticut, teaches this guy Wadhams. Wadhams also teaches this other guy, John Norton. Herbie Brooks determines to make redware as a bartering item. He does black, he's a farmer deacon, farmer deacon, church leader, choir, um, choir leader, I should say, singing instructor, teamster, drover, carpenter, sawyer, does blacksmithing occasionally, does pottery. When you're cranking out pots, well, I'll put it this way, Herbie Brooks' last production, except for, a, he made pottery from the, for obviously from his youth, all the way to the age of 87, he died at 92. And the last day on the wheel, he made 120 16 to 18 inch milk pans, which probably weigh around 10 pounds a piece. A pot is worth of a thousand pounds of clay a day on the wheel. So he made milk pans. So he was still cranking out the pots, which really surprised me, um, at the age of 87. Other than the Georgia adventure, basically, the local market. John Norton, on the other hand, and, and her, like I said, Herbie's son did not want to be, Isaac did not want to be a potter, so he ran away. Um, so the it didn't continue. But John Norton in William, uh, moved from Litchfield up into Williamstown, did a little redware clay, moved up into Bennington, Vermont, did some more redware, decided that it'd be best to import stoneware clay, started bringing stoneware up, decided that the stoneware clay could be covered with a similar glaze to the redware glaze, and he was making fancy molded wares of flint enamel. But as this is going on, you're looking at five, three, five, seven year periods where the shop is becoming new owners. He's investing with his brother, he's investing with his in-laws. I mean, this just keeps flipping and flipping and flipping and flipping because it's a grunt to be a potter. No matter who you sell to, there's only so much, as I said before, that you can sell to them. He does stoneware like this. His sons move off into Nashville, New Hampshire. They move up into Maine. They try doing stoneware pottery. They give up on the redware. Potters from Waitley, Mass, who were redware potters, uh, in the 1820s, decided to just go into making redware and black lace teapots and stoneware and drainage pipes. But guess what? Families are created. You got sons. So there's only so much pottery you can do. They go to Bennington. They work in Bennington. They go up into Maine. They go to Nashua. They just really, everybody's trying to make a living at this. The Waitley Potters, two of the boys, it was 1849. They went to California. Never to be heard from again. Gold Rush. The Norton boys up in Bennington, they have sons. One of them goes down to Worcester, goes to Water Street, cranking out stoneware pots. 1870s, 1880s, up in um, West Sterling, they're making these flat emery wheels for, for grinding steel. Great for the Worcester steel industry. The Swede comes in and says, hey, you take clay, you take glass, you take walnut shells, you put them together, you make these big discs, you fire them in the kiln, the walnut shells burn out, leaves the glassy edge, you got yourself a grinding wheel. Norton Company takes off, all I should say, the business, that part of it, to Frank Norton's lament, because he's cranking out this, he literally is a quote that says, I'm those damn wheels are filling up the kiln. He, he's selling so many wheels, he can't fire the stoneware. So stubbornly, he anchors into the stoneware. He sells off the other business, the grinding wheels, to some people named Higgins <laughs> and Norton and Washburn, who was in the steel industry. 
And they feel they need, needed an educated um, workforce, so they created Worcester Trade. And then they also created Mechanics Hall for Lyceum. So they really exploded up at Bobber's Crossing. They bought an old farm from Bob. It was called Bobber's Crossing because Bobber had a farm there. And they created this big grinding wheel industry. Well, 1880s was wonderful, but 1890s you got glass milk bottles. So guess what Frank's doing? He loses his shirt, finishes up doing stoneware pottery. So the stoneware is going to be the end all, but ceramic technology is where Massachusetts is going to really, you know, start going with as far as pottery production goes. Um, there are going to be other potters working with the red clay in the Boston area that decide that they all have to be pretty. So they're doing some decorative pottery, deciding to bring maybe up some white clay, they're digging some white clay in Boston, um, or they're digging it out in town um, south of Sheffield, now known as Montgomery, but originally was known as Clay Town, it's at the Four Corners, and it's a white clay pit. Um, this is a clay town brick. Uh, Somerset was known as Potter's Town. It was a Pottersville up in uh, New Hampshire. West Sterling was another Pottersville. So there were some pockets of big, big industry. The problem is that you're looking at it for a short period. You're looking at things always moving. It's difficult to sell pottery. So even if you're looking at you know, you look at Norton and you say, wow, I went through four generations. Well, not really. It constantly flips. You're constantly involved, uh, evolving your product, trying to make new product, trying to keep the business going. Um, that's the difficulty of it. If you go into, if you do it for a lifetime, that's pretty good. If your son picks it up, that's a rarity. You go into a third generation, that's pretty freaky. The longest length of time that I have for a pottery shop is Abraham Hughes in Weston, Mass. Rev War period. He is making the little same stuff here. Eventually, from Weston, he moves to West Cambridge. Um, sets up a pottery shop there. As we get into the 1830s and to the 1850s, He's stuck making none of this stuff planters. He's doing planters. That's what, actually, that's even what the Peabody Potter was doing. Planters. The Weston Potter Abraham Hughes, his grandson's cranking out planters, and, and he's doing this ornamental stuff, plow, shaping uh, lamp hangers um, from the ceiling. He's doing all this pretty stuff, wall sconces. Continuing on to 1960, they're still cranking out machine-made, standard red clay flower pots like we all know, the tapered base ones. 1970s, they moved to Lemonster, plastic capital of Massachusetts. It's called New England Planter then. Started making plastic planters. Stayed in the pot business, but different material. Um, so that's the longest run, perhaps, because I can't say that Norton, but being sold into St. Gobain, is still is in the family because it's not. Um, as a, is this a little, when I said plastic, I reminded myself of something. The Greek name for potter isn't as simple to say. Uh, I'm sure um, some of you are familiar with the term angioplasty. If between the G and the I you put an E and you pronounce it angioplastis, then that's the Greek word for potter. Another name for a vein is what? What? Blood vessel. Angio. Vessel. Plasty means plastic, malleable. 
So whether you're going through a rhinoplasty or whatever, <laughs> it means to shape. And that was the part of, I, I think that's an odd little thing to throw out there, but. Um, let's see how we're doing time-wise. Ooh, oh, 8.21, okay. One other weird thing I want to show you here is this was gifted to me. A friend of mine, um, was, it was given to him. This is from 1711 to 1740. This is what happens when red clay is over fire. It will turn black. This was from the kiln load of Grace, maybe one of the, maybe Grace Parker's, one of the potters in Charlestown. Her kiln melted down and everything glued together. So that is, and you can see right here the pad. This is a piece of kiln furniture. I believe this was a chamber pot. And it just completely, it should have been a red one, but it turned black. You see, the thing about clay is that it's actually a powdered glass that you can't see through. That's the way to look at it. It's powdered rock, and depending on how, it's, just, it's no different than the window glass and vacuuming. It's got a high melting sand, somewhere around 2700 degrees, and Mother Nature added, or you can add to window glass, Sodium, potassium, calcium lowers the melting point. Mother Nature threw that in the clay naturally. She also added alumina to the clay, and the alumina makes it opaque. That's why you can't see through this. That's why we call it pottery, for instance. Um, as iron is introduced, if the, if the clay stays put, it's going to be a white clay. Maybe a stoneware clay. If it moves about, it's going to pick up iron. A lot of iron, red, little iron, yellow. So, uh, well, uh, before I mentioned uh, yellowware, I think, uh, uh, being made up in Bennington, Vermont. So you take yellow stoneware clay, and you add this glaze on the pots to it, and you get what's called yellowware. It's a hybrid between the two. Colonial potters would shake lead on the damp pots, and that would make the glaze on the pots, because the, the lead would attack the sand in the clay and melt into a glass coating. After the Rev War, we're mixing sand with lead and clay. We're dipping the pots into the solutions like a watery frap, and then in the heat of the kiln, it will melt on the pots. If you recognize that the lead attacks the sand and the clay in the colonial pots and melts the glass coating, then maybe you can understand how salt glaze is done. I use sodium instead of lead sodium in the glass to lower the melting point. Well, with the sand in the clay already, when this pot was glazed, it was done cold. When this pot was glazed, it was done hot in the heat of the kiln. So the pots are glowing, and glowing a yellow, uh, or even a white, and you throw regular table salt in. And the sodium attacks the sand in the clay and makes it glass coating on the pots. You call it a salt glaze. When Grace Parker in 1711 was making stoneware, she left the inside generally unglazed, unless the salt got in it. So jugs would be very difficult to glaze on the inside. Mugs would be one thing, but stoneware pots like this are difficult. And crocks that she was making would be very rough on the inside. Because this stuff has a melting point where it starts to um, basically turn into this <laughs> at the temperature that retains the form in the kiln, they were taking cousins of the red clay, pouring it on the inside of the pots, and this is what, they call it an Albany slip, but there are examples of stoneware pots where the Albany slip on the inside isn't from Albany, New York. They're taking the red clay and they're just throwing some lead in it, and that will make a glass coating on the inside. The brown glaze on the inside is because otherwise the surface of the pot is rough and it's just nice to have a crock that's nice and smooth on the inside. So these pots here are earthenware because they chip easier than this, which is more stoneware, stone-like. So that's the difference in the terms.
Then there's another temperature above that where if you impart transluc uh, translucency by mixing two white clays together, then that's porcelain. Uh, and we couldn't understand how to do it in England the way the Chinese were doing it. So they were lowering the melting point of the clay in the kiln by adding sources of potassium, uh, phosphorus and calcium from bone, which made bone china. Um, ox bone supposedly was the best. Uh, they were adding soapstone, so soapstone was a lower, lowest the melting point. And they were also adding powdered glass, which is what's called soft paste porcelain. So we can create hybrids between the materials as well. And with that, I um, more than happy to answer any questions. Can you describe the uh, yellow pot with the four people? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, this is again one of those instances where I'm on Facebook, and I can, at this point, I am associated with Jamestown archaeologists, with um, Colonial Williamsburg. I do work for Colonial Williamsburg. <laughs> I've asked everybody out there, has anyone ever found one of these archaeologically? No. But reenactors like to carry them around. <laughs> um, you go to, there's a lot of them in the Flint Museum, but I can't even find a legacy of possession in any household in this country. This here is called a puzzle jug. It's got holes in it, it's got maybe holes up here, and what happens is it says, here, gentlemen, come try your skill. I'll hold a wager, if you will. To come and drink this liquor all without you spill or let, let them fall. So obviously you can't tip it. So you need to figure out how to drink out of it. And the way it works is by maybe you block one or two up here and draw out of the other one. But one of these could be blocked, too. You don't know. You're looking at it. And that's still not going to work. Because as devious as I am, I put a hole underneath over here. So you've got to block it there, then you've got to block these two here, then you can draw it out. So these can also be made very large. As opposed to something else you also find some of the, collect, uh, some of the reenactors carrying around, these fuddling cups, which is where the word the fuddled comes from. And um, this, one, this one is a repro. It says, as the ring is round and has no end, is love unto my friend. So the three cups, and they can go to ten cups, they can go fifteen cups. It's a big triangular one up at um, um, Historic Deerfield. There's a ring bottle that has about five of them collected around the top, which makes it even more confounding. And it's, it's, a, it's a game. It's a game, and um, there are holes that connect inside this container. So when you go to drink out of it, and you know, I, I, I read a lot on this stuff. So one, one guy posed the fact that, oh, you can't mix alcohol with cream. So you put cream here, you put alcohol here. And it's like, really, white Russian? Come on now. That doesn't work. Um, or you mix two alcohols together and you drink out of the third. And then a reenactor came to me. And he just said it. He goes, you know, you fill all three of them up. You tell your friend, I bet you your horse, you can't empty the cup. As silly as that. So you start drinking, and you drink it, and you drink it. And that's why it works. This is a fuddle cup. And I don't think they're really found out here. Um, I know archaeology, I can't confirm any of them being found archaeologically. But they're a collector's item. And actually, the word befuddle, the word fuddling, is actually a regional colloquialism in England. So it's even a smaller area, I think, than what we profess today. What's that? So it's a puzzle jug. They found in England. Yeah. But in a small area. It wasn't like even widespread. In no. Yes? Could you talk about what they fired their kilns with? Oh, okay. Kilns. I didn't talk about that. I, um,. So Grace Parker's in Boston. There are two types of kilns. You got the poor Potter kiln down, you got the kiln down in Virginia, and you got Grace Parker's up in Charlestown. He's got a box 
fire on the end, chimney on the other end. So the fire box goes up, goes over the flat top kiln, big box, and then goes up the chimney. Hers looks like a bottle. Um, maybe it doesn't even have on top of it a bottleneck like you see at Old Sturbridge Village to increase the, the, the draft. It could be the same as the Greek kilns, just a dome. And um, as I mentioned already, the, the pots would be glazed by either dusting them with lead, or maybe they're not glazed, it doesn't really matter, um, if you're doing salt glazing. They go into the kiln, and in this case it would be fired with wood, uh, until we become entirely deforested for the most part, 80% deforested by the 1830s in Massachusetts, which has us as part of either moving up towards the fuel up in Maine, for instance, and out into New York State, or paying a lot of money, because at Old Sturbridge Village, with the, the 21 foot tall bottle kiln, we used to go through three quarters of pine and a quart of hardwood in about 20 hours. So, the wood fired kilns were the most common. We're going to extend into some coal burning kilns, probably about Civil War era. And you can find coal in Worcester, believe it or not. There is coal in Massachusetts as well. Earlier, I, I, I lightly touched upon, um, I'm from Warren. I, I lightly touched upon brick making and mosquitoes. It's uh, an odd bit of information. This is an Amherst brick, for instance, m and This is off the bike trail from South Amherst. Um, in my town of Warren, we used to make steam pumps. A guy from East Cambridge, before I said this, East Cambridge, Mass, had a big brickyard out there. And he bought the Knowles steam pump and moved it to East Cambridge. He was also a brick maker. And he needed the pumps for one simple reason, because the deeper you go in the pit, the more it fills up with water. So he had to suck out the water in order to continue digging clay. And if you want to hear the story about how dangerous clay pits are, that's just another story. So Knowles pumps went to East Cambridge. Pumps for sucking the water out of clay pits all over. And there's this guy in Medford that wants to create the improved silkworm. Uh -uh. And he puts these mason jars out on the windowsill and one of them rolls off and the silkworm escapes with its meat. And now we got the gypsy moth caterpillar all over the place. In the 1890s they had to shovel off the, the clay pits in Medford constantly of the larvae, of the caterpillars, so they wouldn't get drawn up and clogged the pumps that were bought to go to Warren, uh, from Warren that, when they went to East Cambridge. There were that many caterpillars at that point that would still torment us today. And as I also mentioned earlier, we had the, um, the scare of um, the fever that went from Boston down into Providence and uh, the Massachusetts Senate, uh, Massachusetts um, laws came through and said that you had to close up your clay pits. So you're looking at 150, 250 acre clay areas that were being filled in. And why was, I wasn't trying to understand why, because they were full of water and that was They're attracting mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, yeah. Okay. Malaria was all over. It was and that very included bad. The, the brick pits out here in, in South Amherst, too? That well, that's why we moved out here. Oh. That's why we moved out here, because it was cleaner that way. So you have, um, that's right, I didn't touch upon the industry so much. The history of Westfields, I know it was written in the 1890s. It claims at that point there were 3,300 brickyards in Massachusetts. Three comma. So you know it's not a it's not a typo. I can't. Brickyards at that point, I think, were a lot of different types. A man and two boys can make a thousand bricks a day. Ten thousand bricks through the chimney. Ten days worth of work. Burn a load of bricks. Fine. The Medford yards are using steam power to make bricks. 25,000 bricks a day, big difference. Weighing eight to 10 pounds a piece, quarter. 
250,000 pounds of clay coming out all the time. So, the, um, the industry was huge, it's big expansive areas, malaria comes in, so you find the potters and uh, you find the brick makers coming into the brook fields, you find uh, into Amherst, all the way out into Lee, there's going to be some large brick yards. Um, going down towards the Blackstone Valley, because they got sandier clay down there. Next to uh, Ashland, Mass., Northampton was the one that had the re reputation for shoddy bricks, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, it actually, they were, they were taken to court because they were building the woman's prison and it collapsed, and they claimed it was the fault of the Northampton brick, <coughs> um, which is heading out down Route 5. So, um, although, you, although any brick structure you find, whether it's a foundation or whatever, for any period was probably made locally within, I'd say, five or ten miles, there are towns where no brick making would have existed. My town where I grew up, Sturbridge, no brick makers. Southbridge, yes. Brimfield, yes. Holland, yes. But not Sturbridge, big sand pit. So, but um, in Southbridge, you didn't have potters. Clay was too sandy. Holland, you had potters and brick makers. Brimfield, potters and brick makers. Um, out here, uh, Tully Lake had uh, several potters. The Southwicks are up there. Uh, the Southwicks were potters from Peabody, Mass. And they go all the way to uh, Chautauqua in New York uh, making pottery. And um, matter of fact, they supposedly created a tourism industry in upstate New York. The, the clay um, around here doesn't have as prominent the recognition of history, of pottery history, as Peabody, Salem, Medford, West Sterling, um, Somerset, uh, Lee at the base of Bear Mountain, um, Brookfield, uh, Brook, the Brookfields. Um, those are the hotbeds. Gloucester, Ipswich, one part of Gloucester, a bunch of them. You know, it's crazy. Yes? So why did the, uh, the big uh, brick place down in Emerson eventually close? Was it just that it was no longer economical or? Uh, Trains. I think that's the big thing. And that's what kills the industry here in Massachusetts. When you get into the flat lying areas out west where there's clay and there's trains and there's shipment, um, I think the, um, that's where you're going to have Akron was actually the stoneware capital of, Massachusetts, of, of the country before it ever was the rubber capital. Akron was the stoneware capital. Ohio is going to take over the business. You connect it with trains and art pottery. So the bricks, I think, are coming from the Midwest more so. Um, New England brick. The brickyards were, were having a difficult time in Massachusetts. And New England brick, and you'll find Nebco, any BCO bricks uh, occasionally. And they were, I think they probably ran a, a good 20 plants in New England at one point because they were just picking up the carcasses of the brickyards that weren't, weren't able to continue anymore. Um, and again, with the steam engines, you're making 20, 25,000 bricks a day. Um, Taunton, Mass., in the 1880s, I read reference where they produced a million bricks a year, takes six, four months to fire, six months to cool. So it's not just a question of cranking them out, it's a question of ways to have the product to sell, which is the other difficulty. Yes? How do you form the ring bottle to keep the nickel hollow? Most pots, all pots, you center a round ball. And then as the ball is, op is spinning, you open it up, you leave the bottom, and you stretch it out into the wall. In this case, you go all the way down to the wheel head, pull it out so it's a donut. Split the donut in half, create an inner wall, create an outer wall, pinch the two together. And, um, that's how the ring bottles are made. In China, they were being made as teapots. 
about 1100 AD. So they morph into a lot of different shapes. So that means you have to make a scene when you bring yep. the insect. Yep. There is a scene, but when you fold it up, different people make them different ways. When I bring it up, I then fold that the, the pinched wall over to seal it. So inside it might be rough. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. And it's not perfectly round either. That's, that's an odd shape. Little flattened on top. They don't hold much. And you know what's really I you seldom find them this big. Um, there's a collector of them I know out of New York State. Most of them are this size that he has, the mid-19th century, and supposedly they were to hook onto the horn of a saddle. And sometimes a donut, well, I don't even think, would fit over the horn. I think they're just a whimsy at this point, really. Um, more so than anything else, just to have fun making it, because they really are not that fun. A lot of the stuff I make is that. <laughs> a separate question. Uh, what was the problem with the Northampton bricks? Was it the material? I don't think they were, it was... People. It, uh, it was the people. <laughs> <laughs> well, other than being flaky, uh, <laughs> it should be easily. They were soft fired. I guess that's what it was, was they were not brought up to a full heat. Oh. Um, but, I should mention this, the Northampton, across the river, the first part of the come up was from Connecticut, his name was Gibbs, and he settled in Northampton. That was in the 1780s. A part by the name of Hall, who possibly apprenticed, his father probably worked with Grace Parker, and there seems to be some association with Tufts as well. Moved to uh, moved with his father and became potters. Uh, they both ran a shop for a while um, outside of Boston. And then Jonathan Hall decided that he would open up a pottery shop in Dorchester. And the um, no Roxbury. He built a shop, and within a year somebody arsoned it. Built it again, somebody arsoned it. So then he moved out here into Northampton and bought the Gibbs shop. So that's 1780s, and he, he had claimed that Gibbs and him were the first potters you know, on that side of the river as well. So. The clay pit, where I'm going with this, the clay pit for him, Jonathan Hall, is where the three county fair is. Oh, interesting. And his shop was across the street on one of the side streets. So that's old pottery making area. Yes, in um, in the revolutionary period, how how expensive an item would it be for a family to buy the pottery for their household? Would this be a big expense, or well, milk pans go for fifty cents each, and um, if you're a laborer, you're making twenty five cents a day, maybe even as low as twelve cents a day. And if you're highly skilled and you're earning a dollar fifty a day, so it's relative to that. Um, some things are, you know, lower price. Milk pans are the biggest ones. That's why I'm going off of that. Uh, they're 18 inch, 20 inch, slant sided bowls for for raising cream from milk. And um, a, a mug. Let me think. What Parker was selling. Mugs were going for around a dime, 15 cents each, which still is, is up there. Yes? So in a small town like Pelham, likely there wouldn't have been a potter. Would people instead have um, made their own? You well, know, you can never make your own. No? Okay. No. Um, it's, it's a little too tricky, um, especially with the expense of getting the wheel and the kiln going. Um, there's going to be a lot of peddlers going through, as well as a store, a local store that would be interested in it. Uh, so the pottery coming into this town could be coming from Orange, could be one of the three potters up there, could be coming over from Northampton. Like I said, the Brookfields had a huge amount of pottery that were being produced. Got a gentleman back there that beat you if you're raising your hand. Yes. 
I thought it was you, yeah. Yeah, uh, I was curious, you mentioned a few different types of places they were getting clay. Drumlins, you mentioned marine clays, yep. and lake clays. Yep. Did they lead to different types uh, of like the different, different ways different you work clay and different types of pottery that came from those three different types? Well, the drumlin uh, that made Bunker Hill was largely brick making area. Um, that's where the industry was. And supposedly the, the battle of Bunker Hill was even fought behind the brick kilns. Going towards the shore of Boston Harbor, away from there, is where the clay pits were for, um, uh, for potters. So apparently the slamming of the clay by the glaciers against the rock that formed the drumlin took the heaviest material and then what washed away into a low flat lying area, I would think, I'm not a geologist, uh, from the glaciers melting, deposited the finer clay. In, uh, let me get this right, in South Danvers, now known as Peabody, the brick making clay is in Danvers because it's coarser, and the pottery making clay was in Peabody, which is south of Danvers, south Danvers. So um, deposits will control where the industry will be. Unless you either want to take the sand and gravel out of the clay, or you want the other exercise of adding sand to the clay. In Brookfield, Mass, where the clay is very smooth, I was brought out by a friend, Bob Wilder, to all the brickyards. And we were in, we were water level with, or lake level, with clay bog. And uh, we were walking into an overgrown, what would have been a field, you know, a hundred years ago, because the brickyard disappeared in the 1920s. And in the middle of this overgrown woodlot now, was this big wart, a big hill going up about 12, Feet. And I recognized what it was. Um, earlier I said you have to freeze clay. You harvest your clay, you freeze it above ground in the winter time. Bricks are generally 18 to 25 percent sand. Took the shovel, dropped it into this big mound, eight inches of clay, four inches, of, uh, no, 12 inches of clay, four inches of sand, all the way up. So when they went to mix the clay in the mixer, there was pretty much get in the proportion uh, that they wanted. And that, that was the, the Brookfield problem, because the clay was what we call fat or rich, versus if it's uh, coarse or sandy and it's too sandy. In my town of Warren, my clay is shapeable on the wheel, but it's got such a fine sand in it that for pots, I, I can throw with it on the wheel, but I can't pick them up when they dry, they just shatter in my hands. So that's why we were a brick making town. Uh, and a small brick making kind of like that. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I, I was just, I, last detail was just marine versus freshwater. Like, oh, uh, the marine, I forgot to, yeah, um, I, I, you did hear me talk about Peabody being in layers, right? Uh, what happened, uh, maybe I didn't mention that, and I thought about it. Mentioned, yeah. With the shell, with yeah. the shell in it, yeah. yeah there was a big um, hush hush because they dug through the freshwater clay and they got into the shell-bearing clay, ocean shell-bearing clay, really old. And they were all sworn, the brick uh, makers were sworn to secrecy because they were producing brick with shell. You fire the shell, it turns to lime. The lime rehydrates, pops out of the clay. I, I, one of my suppliers was selling me clay for a while that had limestone chunks in it. So I was firing my pots, and I, sometimes I'd take them out of the kiln and I'd have a line pop out. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen overnight sometimes. It can happen next year. So I sell you a nice pot, and suddenly your pot is blowing up on the shelf. So this was a big hush-hush thing in Peabody anyway, the bricks. They didn't want people to think they were making inferior bricks, but they were making inferior bricks. <laughs> <laughs> any, any questions? Yes. Um, how do you, uh, is it possible to know where a brick was made? Oh yeah. Uh, by how, how would you? Because well, I have some old bricks from a paper mill in Adams where my grandfather worked, and they tore some of the buildings oh, down. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you've got a problem that could be in the Vermont side or it could be on the, uh, it could go into Lee because that's the, the whole section down there. If they're stamped, it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. If they're not stamped, then you can only tell the period for the most part. Uh, this is, this is um, like I said, this is a South Amherst brick by name on it. So, um, so I have a good brick from Godner. The guy's last name was Prayer. So all the bricks say Prayer on them. Huh. Or Prayer. <laughs> so pray. Pray. Yeah, that's so the is there thing. like a, a place where you could look it up if you knew the initial? Oh yeah, um, you, you look up uh, the name of the website is uh, Bricks, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, there's a museum down in Connecticut, uh, outside of Granby, Mass. Down, uh, maybe in Enfield, Connecticut. There's a big show, or Scotland, Connecticut. There's a big show, you know, a small engine show every year, and they open up the Brick Museum. And, uh, any questions? Thank you. Oh, one more. Oh, on that, the fire bricks, what between them? Ah, okay. Yep. So, this is a red clay brick, and it would be used for um, house construction, fireplaces, stuff like that. This is a white clay, they call the kaolin brick that was being made in Clayton or Claytown, Massachusetts. They were also being made in Blanford, Mass. Um, if you uh, read about the paper mill that was going to be converted into, um, I think they were going to burn uh, to create electricity there a few Russell, years yeah. back yeah. in Russell. That's the clay, that's where they were making white clay bricks, Blanford's brick as well, and they were a little yellow. Um, Buy a brick, stoneware clay, that's all it is. If I built my stoneware kiln out of the red clay, I would not have the kiln standing long. It's certainly the As a matter of fact, the, the, there are numerous stories of potters. See, the kiln expands and contracts, expands and contracts. So we were considered to be um, obnoxious and a nuisance in the 17, early 1700s in Boston, so they zoned us to the coastline. As a matter of fact, we were zoned out of the city um, where people lived and where markets were because we were a fire risk. Uh, kilns collapsing during the firing were quite common. Um, I have a reference to a potter in East Brookfield where they were taking the kiln shelves, uh, the, 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 the wear boards, the furniture. The kiln must have had one wicked crack in it and it was just losing heat. So they ended up dismantling practically the whole shop trying to get this kiln load going. But if you're losing heat through a big crack, that means you're drawing cold air at some point through it, and they lost the whole load over there. Um, I have references of potters dying from the kiln collapsing on them when they're unloading the kiln. They were just taking a risk of it um, at that point. So. Um, they don't last forever, probably about 20 or 30 firings, and you have to rebuild them. The worst I read was a potter whose old kiln in the 1780s, he was losing one load after another, and finally he took the kiln down, and he found that the rats had bored through the pad underneath the, the kiln, and they were basically just creating flues of cold air, and it was just blasting the pots and cooling them down too fast. I lost four kiln loads of that. Any other questions? That's it. Well, thank you. Thank you.